the uh, audience that uh, Pope Benedict gave was uh, in December 2010. Uh, on Julian of Norwich. Let me just read the in little introduction to it. Um, he says, I, I still remember with great joy the apostolic journey I made in the United Kingdom last September. England is a land that has given birth to a great many distinguished features who enhanced church history with their testimony and their teaching. One of them, venerated both in the Catholic Church and in the Anglican Communion, is the mystic Julian of Norwich, of whom I wish to speak this morning. The very scant information on her life in our possession comes mainly from her revelations of divine love in 16 showings, the book in which this kindly, and devout woman set down the content of her visions. It is known that she lived from 1342 until about 1430, well, I would say 1420. Turbulent years both for the church, torn by the schism that followed the Pope's return to Rome from Avignon, and for the life of the people who were suffering the consequences of a long drawn out war between the kingdoms of England and of France. God, however, even in periods of tribulation, does not cease to inspire figures such as Julian of Norwich to recall people to peace, love, and joy. And then he goes on. The Pope carefully avoids some of the more controversial issues in Julian, but nonetheless, he gives blanket approval to her. You know, he doesn't criticize her at all or her teachings. Um, and I, I would be remiss, uh, to me especially, <laughs> if I didn't uh, uh, push a little bit. Um, well, I have two books on Julian. One is called Julian of Norwich. <laughs> Where are they? They're in the bookstore. <laughs> uh, Julian of Norwich, A Mystic for Today, and the other one, the, I think the other one's really not available. The publisher went out of business right after he published my book. <laughs> uh, it was published by Dove Publications. That's uh, uh, it was a renewal of an old charismatic printing company that was run by the Benedictine monks of um, uh, in New Mexico. What's the name of the monastery? Pecos. Pecos. Yeah, and, but I, I think they, uh, they're kind of floundering. But that book was called All Manner of Things. Uh, but I, I, just a word about my book, though, on, on Julian, uh, A Mystic for Today. And, and by the way, tomorrow um, I'll be coming over for supper. So if you all want to buy copies of it at the bookstore, I'll autograph them tomorrow night if you want. Um, I, will not auto I will not autograph. I will not autograph Thomas Keating's books. <laughs> I can't tell you how often I've been asked to do that. <laughs> I, I stretch sometimes. I've, on occasion, I've autographed The Cloud of Unknowing. <laughs> Father Williams, some of these people don't know how many times you have read that book. Nor do I. <laughs> when was your last count? Oh, I don't know. It's two or three hundred. I, I read it every time I give a workshop on contemplative meditation. But uh, I, I don't mind signing that because I kind of own it, you know. <laughs> I practically have memorized it. Um, but I, I would like to uh, just read you the introduction to uh, my book on, on Julian of Norwich, a mystic for today, uh, just to you know t tell you a little bit what I did. Um, on May 13, 1373, Dame Julian had a series of 16 visions she spent 20 years meditating on them, that is, using them in, for her Lectio Divina. During that interval, Julian the Visionary became Julian the Theologian. Oh no, this, this is the introduction to my book, uh, the, the, um, the one that's not available. 
In a previous book, Julian of Norwich, A Mystic for the 21st Century, I tried to rewrite chapter by chapter Julian's book, The Revelations of Divine Love, in an attempt to make its expression more in sync with today's readers. Um, this book, however, has a different purpose. It's intended to provide a source of Lectio Divina and to be an expression of my own Lectio Divina on Julian's theology. Well, we needn't get into that. Um, uh, so one, one thing that I do want to, a little thing I'd like to mention, uh, there are so many things and there's so you know, little time to mention them, but what I call uh, Julian's bipolar theology, a uh, spirituality. Uh, um, you know, bipolar means up and down. Uh, 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 St. Ignatius in the spiritual exercises refers to it as periods of desolation and consolation. And uh, uh, Julian is kind of strong on this. Uh, apparently she had that, you know, experience herself. Uh, and, uh, but what, uh, the thing that she says, and I think it's very beautiful, she says, remember that God loves you as much in woe as he does in weal. Weal means happiness, woe is sorrow. Huh? So God loves you as much when you're sorrowing and suffering as he does when you're happy and peaceful. Uh, that's something for us to, uh, to keep in mind. Um, what I would like to, to stress now is uh, chapter 51 and um, Julian's uh, story or parable, if you will, of the master and the servant. Um, it goes on for maybe five, six pages. I'm only going to look at the first couple of paragraphs of it and, and leave the rest up to you. Uh, it's very powerful. I think it's the most significant work done by a theologian in, 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 all, in just about 2,000 years of Christianity. And it's funny because I've never seen this in any of the other commentaries on Julian. Uh, some or other people haven't got this. Um, but what, you know, the, in the book of Genesis and the two creation accounts and everything that follows from it, the uh, Cain and Abel, uh, then, you know, the Tower of Babel and uh, the flood and, and the Noah's Ark, all the way up to Abraham, is what we call prehistory. It is not history. It is not factual. It is not to be taken literally. Even as conservative as the last two popes have been, Benedict and John Paul, they both come out very strongly stating that those first 15 chapters of the book of Genesis are mythology. Now that's not a dirty word. A mytho no, it doesn't mean they're fairy tales either. Mythology, according to you know, anthropologists and, 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 and the literary people, mythology is an imaginative way to express a profound truth. And every religion has its mythologies. Now, the mythologies in Genesis. Now, I, I believe, although I'm not too sure what it means because the church has never really come out with any clarity on it, the Bible is inspired, okay? Uh, and and it's, it's, it's the word of God using the, the word, the verbiage of men, women. Uh, but it's uh, 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 Abraham <clears throat> smacks a little bit of mythology, but it's too obvious that the descriptions of the circumstances of Abraham's life and his migrations and and his the events of his life they ring true for the year, say around 2000 BC. Uh, all all of our, the evidence that we have supports the fact of at least the historicity of. Uh, a man at that time whom we call Abraham. But prior to that, it's all mythology. Now, uh, but, but you must keep this in mind. We are an educated, sophisticated people living in the 21st century. E even, uh, you know, those of us, uh, I have a nephew who's a professor of astrophysics at MIT. He's got an eighth grade education in terms of his faith. 
He's got two doctorates. Um, now, why did I mention that? Um, but the sophistication, even on a secular level, uh, you know, of our society is, is profound. Uh, and uh, even a seventh grade science student is not going to swallow Genesis chapter one, the two accounts of creation. Um, and, and now, and that's all right. Of course it's all right. Uh, I, I remember um, how offended I was one time when I was at one of these think tank things at the Aspen Institute and uh, one of the members of the group was the uh, Secretary of the Navy. I won't tell you who it was, but... Um, and, and the group was given an assignment each night to, to read certain things in philosophy, theology, history, things that these people never touched on. And, and this particular night it was uh, the book of Genesis, chapters 1 to 15, the mythology. And, and this gentleman, um, he was to give a report on it the next day. And he started out his report, he thought he was being very respectful. I, I don't think I was ever so insulted in my life. He said, with apologies to Father William, I, I don't, uh, I believe in evolution. I, I just, I was dumbfounded, you know. Um, I had never ever in my life from the earliest infancy been taught anything but evolution as a not as a theory, but as a scientific reality. I was never taught that the book of Genesis, that the, the mythology of Genesis was to be taken historically, the world created in seven days. But he was a very educated man, very sophisticated man, uh, and trying to be nice, and because I'm a monk, assuming, therefore, that I, you know, was of this low grade of ignorance <laughs> that I accepted the literalness of it. And, and apologizing to me, you know. Um, that's one of the reasons why I launched into Julian of Norwich, because I feel that Julian can hold herself up before the most educated, sophisticated uh, person in the, in, in, in the society today. Uh, but, you see, I, know I respect the inspiration, whatever that means. I really think it has more to do, though, with the listener uh, than with the book itself. The presence of the Holy Spirit when you hear the scriptures read rather than some kind of a divine influence on the written word itself. But they, the teachings of the, of the teaching of the church on that is very, very vague. Perhaps deliberately so, I don't know. But uh, how did Genesis come about, the mythology of Genesis? Well, look, it was written, it was, first of all, it wasn't written, it was spoken. It was oral, it was probably passed down orally for centuries before it was written down. It was only written down around 600 years before Christ. But prior to that, it was spoken orally. And, and it was, it was uh, the mythology, it was the imaginative way of and let's excuse me, but an ignorant, uncultured, unlettered, a nomadic people who could not read or write and who had no history and knew nothing of the world or society or anything else except what happened within their own tent. And this was this was passed down. It was recited at the campfires in the evening. And if you look at the book of Genesis, you can see from the structure of it, how it's, it's written to be easily memorized and, and, and being repeated. In the beginning, God did this, and on the first day, and he saw that it was good, and it was evening and morning, and the first day, and then second, and go right like that. It, clearly, the, the form of it is, you know, to be recited orally, and, and for, so children will remember it. Children of any age. Uh, and, and so it, it was, it was for those people, and it satisfied those people. It, it answered questions like, well, where did it all come from? It also answered questions like, uh, you know, who is this God, and, and, and what is man, and, and what's our relationship to God, and, and why have we fallen away from God? Why do we hurt one another, and why do we, why do we sin, and so forth? And, and all of those profound questions are, 
are answered in a very, what you might say, in a mythological way in the in the story of creation and Adam and Eve. And, uh, and, and it's one of punishment. Uh, you know, God put Adam and Eve in the garden really to test them, you know, and right away he gave them the commandment, don't touch that tree. Uh, and of course, right away, the, the woman touched the tree and gave it to the man. You remember when, when God said to Adam, uh, Adam was hiding, and God said, where are you? And Adam said, I'm hiding because I'm, you know, I ate of the tree and I was afraid. And, and God says, well, you know, what happened? And he says, well, the woman you gave me, the woman you gave me, she gave me to eat. Uh, you know, he just pushed off the blame on Eve. Uh, and this was all right for those at that time. Our women are too sophisticated now to take that nonsense. Uh, and, 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 uh, uh, so, well, where do we stand today? How, how do we deal with this? How do we translate it? How do we accept it? It's offensive to women. Uh, women were taken from the rib of Adam. That was all right 4,000 years ago. It's not all right today. Well, well what about, uh, you know, we do have women in the church. Even in the Catholic Church, we have women. Uh, and and uh, so that it's not acceptable. Now, no one has really done anything about it except, you know, theologians try to say, well, let's forget it or ignore it or whatever. But Julian did something about it. Julian actually had the courage, the gumption, the not, well, actually it was Jesus who did it for Julian. But let, let's get, let's, Julian is a secondary cause, let's, you know, credit her with it. Julian actually wrote a new mythology. No one has ever done that. Julian was not satisfied with what came out of the book of Genesis because it didn't come out of the fullness of God's revelation, which is in Christ Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. A revelation coming from a matrix of love, expressing itself in love, and only uh, expressing itself in love, never in condemnation or judgment. But Genesis is full of condemnation and judgment. Uh, and, and, you know, it, 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 Adam and Eve, they had to be tested, failing, kicked out of the garden, punished. Uh, for the, you know, you'll earn your living now by the sweat of your brow, and she will give birth in pain and suffering. Uh, you know, that, that's the, that, that whole bit. It, it answered questions for the nomadic tribesmen. 4,000 years ago, it doesn't answer questions for the seventh grader in a science class today. Uh, but, but Julian gives us a new mythology. Uh, and and uh, keep this in mind now, when I, when I tell you her mythology, she's not trying to repeat what's in Genesis. She's doing far more than that. She's giving us a new Genesis, a new mythology to understand in the light of the Holy Spirit who is present in the church, uh, to understand the human race and to understand our redemption in Christ Jesus. Now here's, uh, here is Julian's story. I'm only going to talk about the beginning. She goes into it in much greater detail than I'm going to. I leave that up to you to look at. But uh, you know that, um, first of all, we, uh, St. Paul does this and a number of other writers do, that Jesus is called the second Adam um, because the first Adam was the father of the human race. The second Adam is the father of the redeemed human race, the new human race, if you will. Uh, but, uh, so, uh, but Adam is also, uh, in, in, uh, Adam is Adam, okay, in the mythology. Uh, and then in the New Testament, Adam is the, Jesus is the new Adam. Uh, but also we are there. That's why they speak of us inheriting original sin, because we were present in our father Adam. And therefore, you know, what he did, uh, we also did. Which isn't true, but there you have it. So uh, the, the Adam is like three people, okay? He, he's Adam, he's Christ, and then he's you and me. Uh, now... Um, uh, Julian doesn't have Adam, she has a servant. 
in her mythology. And it's very interesting to note there's no Eve at all in Julian's mythology. Why is there no Eve? Because there is no need of differentiation according to sexes. Julian is talking about human beings. Uh, and women are human beings. That's the implication. Uh, it's, it's, it's weird when you think of it. Uh, and yet it's, you know, it's very profound when you think of it a little further. There's no need to have a, a male and a female figure. All you need is a human being. So there's this, here's the picture Julian gives us of a, of a lord. And the, he's sitting on a throne on a plain outside on a level ground, okay? And he's clearly dressed as a lord. And the significant difference between a lord and a peasant would be in the amplitude of the garments, the flowing sleeves, the long, the long gown, and so forth. Uh, and so the Lord is dressed appropriately, sitting at his throne, and standing beside him is a servant. Now the servant is clearly a peasant. The servant is clothed in a, a, a sort of kind of, you know, leggings and a short kirtle that goes to his knees, and, and it's got rags in it, and it holes, and it's dirty, and, and he's got a kind of a blouse on, and uh, but, but a typical uh, maybe laborer, peasant laborer in Julian's day. And uh, he's standing beside his, his Lord. And you get the impression that his position is like, you know, the position that's taken by uh, people who are starting the 50-yard dash, when he and on the knee bent over, waiting for the go signal, and then whoop, they're off. Well, that's what the servant is doing. He's looking to his master but he's ready to go, you see. In other words, he's eager, uh, incredibly eager, he's totally given to doing what his master wants him to do. Now this is very different, isn't it, from God created a garden and in the garden he put a man and a woman and he said, you may eat of everything but don't eat of this tree. It's a whole different mythology. Here is the human race this is Adam, our father. This is the human race. This is you and me. This is Jesus, the new Adam. He's all these people. He's the servant. And what is he doing? He's waiting by his master's side for a command that he might do his will. Not that he might sin or, or test or, or be tempted by the, a snake and, a, and, and so forth. None of that. But he just wants to know what his master's will is and he wants to do it. Already you have here the, you know, the influence of Christianity. To, well, it could because Christianity is, is the fullness, as te Jesus teaches it, of the Father's will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. This is the bottom line of every prayer made by every Christian. Not my will, but thine be done. And this is what we seek. This is who we are. This is what we do. The will of the Father. Uh, this, in this we find our salvation. We find our happiness. We find our fulfillment. Uh, it's the meaning of our life. Is looking for the Father and to find out what his will is and then doing it. So that's what the servant is doing, okay? And you got that picture, all right? Got that picture in mind? Then the, the, uh, the, the master beck, was, uh, beckons to the servant and kind of leans over and whispers in his ear. Okay? Later on, Julian will tell us what he said, but that's not my concern right now. Get the book and find out. Uh, <laughs> um, and what happens is, like a flash of lightning, the servant is off. He's dashing away as fast as he can go. And why? What's his motivation? His motivation is to do the will of his master. That's all he wants. That's his whole being. Well, that's Jesus, you know. That, that's the crucifixion. The crucifixion is, 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 you know, as Jesus said on uh, Holy Thursday night, not my will, but thine be done. And the crucifixion is Jesus' is complete and absolute amen to the Father. Uh, the Father willed this in order that greater love has no man 
Then he laid down his life for his friend. He wanted to manifest his love through, in, and with Jesus, who would manifest it by giving his life. Uh, Jesus could have redeemed the world by snapping his fingers. Didn't have to die. Uh, why, why, would, why should he have to die? What, what, uh, uh, what, what good does that do except greater love has no man than he laid down his life for a friend? It's a manifestation of God's love. It wasn't a tribute given to the devil as some, early, some of our, our um, uh, uh, early theologians or, well, early middle, medieval theologians have said. It was a ransom paid to the devil. That's ridiculous. Uh, but, so, but here he is dashing off to do the will of his master, okay? Now, in dashing off, he, he had to turn, turn a curve, all right? And, and when he turned that curve, he could no longer see the master, all right? But he's still there, he's going for it to do his will. And what happens? He falls into a ditch. Now, if you were to, you have to climb that hill there, straight across from us, uh, you would see what the ditches are like. Those are, they're honeycombed with irrigation ditches. We have 40 miles of them on the property. Some of them up there are 30 feet deep, and there's no way you can get across them. You have to go all the way around and find a path. And, and if you fell into one, unless somebody knew you were there, you were gone. Well, that's the kind of ditch that he fell into. Uh, and he was, he was all wounded. He was broken bones and and, and he was bleeding, and, and he was... Uh, but, uh, but Julian says, you know, his greatest suffering was he could no longer see his master. Uh, because, you know, he turned the corner, and now he's in this ditch. And that was the greatest suffering that he had. This is the greatest suffering of Adam, the greatest suffering of the new Adam, Christ. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And this is the suffering that we also are called to experience at times in our bipolar uh, experiences of spirituality. And so uh, there he is, wounded and suffering. And it says, but his greatest suffering was he was cut off from his master. And then Julian says, well, you know, and after a while, his sufferings were so manifold, and she goes into some great detail about them, uh, that he actually even, he got so wrapped up in himself in his own pain that temporarily he forgot about his master. And, and all, he, all he did was woe is me, uh, his own suffering. And then, as he lay there suffering and forgetting about his master, now this is the human race, you see, that's being talked about. Um, his master came looking for him. It wasn't like in, in the mythology of Genesis, where were you? Well, I was hiding because I was afraid. Uh, no, it wasn't for accusation. I think it's an incredibly beautiful line. Julian says, his master came and he saw him. He looked down at him. And I'll get these words. And he saw no guilt in him. Where is original sin in this mythology? The master saw no guilt in the servant. Uh, and and, and that's, that's, the new myth, that's the mythology that Christ wants us to have and to understand. You have heard it said that Adam and Eve were in a garden and disobeyed God and were sent outside and sinned and punished and the whole human race is in sin and punishment because of them and the Messiah is promised. You have heard it said, but I say to you, the Messiah has come and it's not time now to look at us as, as original sin, suffering separated from God uh, because my father finds no guilt in you. Uh, this is the way, this is why we have original grace and not original sin. Uh, the Father finds no guilt in us. I, that's absolutely marvelous. And, and that explains the whole attitude. That's a, that's a new mythology. Julian actually rewrote. The more you think of it, the more marvelous it is. 
gives us gives us actually a new mythology that that that's that that is needed because we are no longer this ignorant nomadic unlettered unlettered traveling tribe of 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 wanderers uh, and and we we need something that we can understand and relate to today, and especially that we can understand and relate to in the Christian dispensation, as we have been redeemed by Christ, and, and the love of the Holy Spirit has been made manifest in us through him. So that, that's the new mythology. Then. Um, Julian goes on, and, and there's more to it, uh, but you can, uh, you can check that out yourselves.